Good. So good morning. We are coming towards the end of chapter two of uh, four seventy-two. Tough iron bays in the altar of We're closing out the laws of the four cups of wine. Right? The laws of the order of the four cups of wine is going to come in the next chapters when we discuss the actual Seder of the Seder, the order of the Seder. But for now, we're giving the laws of just the drinking of the wine itself, the fact that we're obligated, who's obligated, how to drink. And the last discussion is what kind of wine to drink. So we began yesterday um, discussing uh, ordinary wine versus places where it's not available and turning raisins into wine. And the last thing we discussed is if one is in a place where wine is not available, which again, today's is not a factor, but the definition of wine not being available in those days meant that in a day's walk around the city, there's no one growing wine, or at least there isn't a lot of wine, a lot of wine being grown. And therefore, it's very, very expensive. Yeah. 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 So we could use what's called Khamar Medina, yeah. which is literally translated as the wine of the region. Namely, what's the prestigious drink there? So he told us this thing called mead, made vash, honey water, which is basically like a it's an alcohol-based drink made out of honey. And therefore, obviously, one has to be careful. There's no grain mixed in that ingredient, so otherwise it's chomets. And um, that was the example of a chamar medina in Russia. Imagine here in, in Canada, be a whiskey a vodka, even a beer. Um, but again, all those have more concern of being chametz based because certainly whiskey, whiskey is definitionally grain, chametz. Yeah, so yeah. beer, definitionally grain, chametz. Yeah. Uh, but vodka, you can get uh, prune-based vodka, orange-based vodka, and potato-based vodka, and so on. Right. Even though, as I mentioned, the Chabad custom is not to drink any or hard alcohol on Pesach, even if uh, it's kosher Passover, technically yeah. speaking. Yeah. Sorry? Tequila is always plant -based. Tequila is plant based. Well, green is also a plant. What kind of plant? Agave. Agave, right. So there you go. Rum is sugar. Rum is sugar, right? Right. Um, bourbon is also grain. It's hop. It's rye, rye, right? Corn. Corn. Yeah. Oh, so that's also, okay. That's, that's kidneyous. Yeah. It's, kidney. it's, a, it's a mix. It's 50% corn. Okay. So it's still hummets or kidneyous. Yeah. Right. Anyway, the point is there's hard alcohol that can be non hummets. Right. Okay, so therefore says Alter in, in Halacha Chavtes, Halacha 29. All of the above, namely, the acceptability of using Chamar Medina when it's when wine is not available has been made vash. Is if you're using this mead drink, this 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 honey-based alcohol, Ukiyotzeba and the like, Mishar Mashkin Achashum, from other prestigious drinks. Because in that region, in that city, this drink replaces wine, right? Yeah. Which is why the wine can't be super available, because if it's not super available, it doesn't replace wine, because you have wine. It's only when it's not available, so you're inviting someone over for dinner and you're putting a glass of alcohol out there, you're giving something else instead. Because And this replaces wine. But other inferior drinks, like apple juice, Shikardin, that we call in Yiddish, apple trunk. <laughs> I guess that's Yiddish for apple juice. Ume <laughs> uh, zangvil, or ginger juice. Shikardin, ingber vasher, <laughs> or vasser. Ingber would be uh, ginger and vasser is water. I guess it's I guess it's a kind of tea. I assume it's a kind of tea. Right, ginger, let's... ginger, yeah. Ginger tea. Yeah, it's a ginger tea of sorts. But like fermented and alcoholic? No, 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 not necessarily. Just the bar. Yeah. All right, because you're ending the fine side, which is right. That's right. Exactly. But then they're, they're not, they're not, they're not a uh, special. Right. Umei shoirish shakarin licorice. Licorice. Or licorice. Yeah. Uh, it's, he says, it, it's uh, made of a root. What's licorice made out of? Root. I think so, licorice root. There you go. In footnote 122, he says, C section 1823, which makes similar statements with regard to kvas, a lightly fermented beverage popular in Russia, and mm -hmm. barsh, beet juice. Oh. See also notes to that section, which discusses whether tea or coffee is acceptable for Khamar Medina. In his Igis Kodesh, Deborah were right that orange juice is unacceptable for the use of four cups for this on the Seder night. Mm -hmm. But coffee and tea is already of a 
we discussed this. Right. There's another video I have here on, online when we went through the halachas of chapter 272 in Al-Tabr Shekhan 10 and 11, which discussed the Chamar we discussed it there. Okay, continuing. Now, even though the average drink in that city is these drinks, these uh, juices, even though it's popular, but because it's not a prestigious, it's considered like water. Even though water, of course, is a popular drink in the city, it cannot be used for kaisha bracha. Kaisha bracha meaning any bracha over which you're reciting a blessing, a cup for benching, a cup for uh, Kiddush, a cup for Abdullah, a cup for the wedding blessings, a cup for a bris. Right? You always hold a cup on these special occasions, these mitzvah occasions, that, that, and that's called a kosher bracha, a cup over which a bracha is recited. Right. So it's not just a question of how popular that drink is, because water is very popular, obviously, and these juices could also be popular. Right. What we're looking for is not popularity, but pre prestige. Mm. And therefore, it has to be the kind of drink that replaces wine. So that's why I, I, I said a way of thinking about it is, is it the kind of drink you would invite someone over for or go out for? Can I say it funny? Yeah. You know, and so uh, when I, I first, learned, first learned this term in the sneaker shirt with Rabbi Bell. Chama Yeah, never heard it before. And I said, so what about seltzer? Everybody loves seltzer. And I said, no, nah, the fact that you and I happen to like seltzer doesn't make it Chama Medina. Right. <laughs> well, so here you want to hear it. Popularity doesn't turn into Chama Medina. Popularity, that's what you reminded me of. It. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Okay, Lamed, Halacha 30. Here he's going to tell us to the, the extent to which this obligation is important, which comes from our, our, our Mishnah. Even a poor person whose livelihood depends on charity. All right, this comes from our Mishnah. Yeah, this is the opening, our opening words of our Mishnah is that, right, there were three Halachas our Mishnah discussed in the Gemara. The idea of making sure of an appetite for the Seder we learned about that in the Shulchan Aruch also. The idea that you have to, that even if you're a poor person, you have to recline. We learned about that. Mm. And that even if you're a poor person, you still have to have four cups of wine. And now we're learning about that. Right? That comes from our Mishnah. And the opening, and therefore it says here, quoting that Mishnah, even a person who's reliant on charity, right, which means he has to collect more now to buy that wine. So you might say, well, the sages enacted to have four cups of wine for freedom, but you can't be free on someone else's husband. Right? You can't be, be, make your freedom on a, a burden on someone else. Right. So says the mission, no, 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 no. You have to do that. It's an obligation like any other. The same way you would rely. Or you know, you God forbid, someone would rely on charity to get a pair of tefillin. So someone has to rely on charity still to get the four cups of wine. It's that important. So I feel I'm as bad as that's lucky. Even someone who's reliant on charity. The Inle Moist like this guy in Labra crisis. He doesn't have money for four cups of wine. Shall I not lag about him? The local guys who are in charge of the charity fund don't didn't give him. So first of all, he's got to go collect money for his four cups of wine. And if he couldn't get it, of little voice, he should go borrow money for his four cups. Or limp sell your clothing. <laughs> sell your clothing, have wine. Not yours. One should sell his clothing. Oh, exactly. I should, God forbid. <laughs> or rent himself out. Hire himself. Get a job. Yeah. Work a little harder. For the purpose of being able to acquire four cups of wine, or shine mashkim, or whatever other drink, if they are acceptable as chamar medina, it's quite uh, it's quite something. Yeah, it's incredible how important it is. Yeah, let's look at footnote one twenty five. God forbid we'll never be in this situation, but still, as he just said, it's important to know how important it is. See Mare Mekoimis Vitsiyunim, which notes that the Alter Rebbe reverses the order in which Rav Yosef Cairo lists these two acts in his Shulchan Aruch. Mm. Here he says, borrow and sell your clothes. And the Shulchan Aruch, I think, would say, sell your clothes and borrow, mm. which means what's first? Should I first borrow? And if I can't borrow, sell my clothes, or first sell my clothes, and if I can't sell my clothes, borrow. Right. Note also the contrast to the purchase of delicacies for Shabbos, in which instance, as stated in section 2423, mm -hmm. one should not borrow money to purchase, right. even though it's important to have delicacies for Shabbos. Right. 
But the halacha is, I say Shabbat Chachol, Turn your Shabbos into a weekday, meaning your food, rather than bar- rather than coming to need other people. But here, by the four cups of wine, we say, no, 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 no. Rely on other people, but get that four cups of wine. Quite uh-huh. powerful. Yeah. He's not saying, like, it's like the shirt off your back. He's saying, like, the shirt, the clothes you would have in your... Closet, suppose. Closet. Right. <laughs> I suppose. can walk around. You sure what I'm saying? Because then... Yeah. A guy walking around naked, I think. Or no, 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 God forbid. I, 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 I see this, yeah, I seem to mean to like sell your clothing, yeah. Okay. Now, the inlay continues. The inlay, El Mat Mois, if he only has a minimal amount of funds, the Meek Neben Yayan Dal Kosis, and if he were to use those funds to buy four cups of wine, La Yila Ner Bebesa, he won't even have candles in his home. Now, candles in his home here means your Shabbos and Yumptive candles, because as we've learned here many times, the Shabbos and Yom Tov candles were middle of Allah 30. Are you there? Yeah. The Shabbos and Yom Tov candles are really for you to enjoy, right? This is, this is the mitzvah. The mitzvah of lighting Shabbos candles is, in contrast to Hanukkah candles, which we're about to observe, God willing, yeah. where Hanukkah candles, we say, you have no right to use them. Right. They have a spiritual nature. The Shabbos candles, on the other hand, are actually designed, and the mitzvah is to produce light in your home mm. so that you can see and that way enjoy Shabbos and Yom Tov. If you can't see, you can't enjoy. Mm. Yeah? Which means, in theory, and in practice in certain circumstances, your electric lights is how you fulfill the mitzvah of Shabbos candles. Because that's what produces light in your home. If someone's in the hospital, and they don't allow for you to light candles, you make a bracha and turn the light on. The literal light. Right. Because that's the point. So now the guy's left with a choice. Either have lamps for my home to be able to see, which would be my Shabbos Yom Tov candles. And I have four cups of wine. I could pay for one, not both. So what's the priority? Says the halacha, buying light for his home comes takes precedent, the Dalat Koisis, over the four cups of wine. Why? Because of peace in the home. Same thing with Hanukkah. If I can afford one candle and I either got to use it for Friday night or for my Hanukkah candle, halacha is used for your Friday night candles. Because your Friday night candles is meant for peace in the home. And peace in the home trumps all. Right? Because if you don't see, you bumping into each other, you can't enjoy. So the peace in the home, embedded in the midst of Shabbos candles, in this case, Yom Tov candles, take precedence over your four cups of wine. So what should you do then? You have no four cups of wine. Now you can make Kiddush on matzah. On bread, your matzah bread. The reason why we said before you shouldn't make kiddush on matzah bread, even though throughout the year you can make kiddush on challah, is because you need four cups of wine, right? And therefore, even if you don't like wine, you should drink four cups of wine. You with me? Yeah. Had a neighbor the pay and say right. Peace in the home takes precedent. Yeah, we said that. Okay. You with me? I want to play yeah. Okay. Yes, and if he's not drinking four cups of wine, yeah. then he should make his kiddush over bread. Right. I.e. matzah. Right. Right. Now, we said before that one cannot make kiddush on matzah the night of the Seder. Right. And therefore, why? Because you have to drink four cups of wine. Right. It's, it's, and therefore, even if you don't like wine, throughout the rest of the year, if you don't like wine, make kiddush on challah or listen to someone else's kiddush. But in this case, you cannot do that because you have to have four cups of wine. Right. But this guy's got down to such poverty that he had to use his last fund to pay for candles in the house. Mm. So he didn't have, doesn't have four cups of wine. Mm. So what's he making kiddush on? Matzah. Because mm. he had no other option. Yeah, really dire straight here. That's this was a reality for Jews, unfortunately, in lots of history where they literally had to cho- choose. I got four bucks. Sure. What am I doing before? Yeah. What should I spend it on? What's my priority? So the first priority is candles, peace in the home. Right? Which is where we see the Gimel, it's in chapter 483. Find okay. Shum, see there in 283. A person who has minimal amount of wine and cannot split that wine between eight cups, four for each night of the Seders, go to chapter 483 and we'll tell you what to do. Okay. Finally, last halacha, halacha 31. This halacha is thrown in here because the Gemara connects it as well. You'll remember we learned in the Gemara. But the Gemara said that men, women, and children are obligated in the four cups of wine. Mm. 
is what the Gemara said. What's the reason? So even though children ordinarily are not obligated in any mitzvahs, and women are not obligated in mitzvahs that are time-bound, here we say they are because they were part of the miracle. Women and children were part of the miracle, yes? Mm-hmm. Right. So the asked, what's the value of having children drink the four cups of wine? The way Najbam explained the question, the Gemara's question is, children aren't the type or aren't in the, in, in the uh, classification of being obligated in anything. So what does this mean? We're telling them to drink four cups of wine. To which the Gemara said, ah, give them nuts to keep them engaged at the Seder. So it's almost as if the Gemara is telling us, this is how I understand the Gemara. It's almost as if the Gemara is telling us, you're engaging the children by giving them candy and nuts and something to enjoy is equal to your drinking four cups of wine. Because we drink four cups of wine to demonstrate our freedom and enjoy the night. Right. How does a kid enjoy the night and demonstrate his freedom? Right. Having nuts and candies. So it's almost like the, the having kids enjoy is akin to our enjoyment with the four cups of wine. That's just almost it sounds like. And therefore, this halacha comes here in this in this chapter, because the Gemara connects this to, right? The Gemara connects the giving the children giving children nuts and something to eat and enjoy. Mm-hmm. Gemara connects that to the obligation of drinking four cups of wine. And therefore, in this set of halachas, <laughs> where we discuss the laws of four cups of wine, this halacha is here as well, halacha 31. Yeah? It's a mitzvah to give the children roasted seeds and nuts. The Lel Pesach on the night of the Seder. And do so before the Seder starts. So that you're engaging them with like funny behavior. And they'll ask, why is night different? You never give us nuts before supper. Now all of a sudden we're getting nuts and treats before supper. What's going on? Mm. It's halacha, give your kids treats before the Seder. Mm. Isn't that nice? It's a nice guy, nice halacha, right? Yeah. And then they're like, oh, wow, what's so special about tonight? Yeah. What's special? It's the Pesach night. Come, let's talk about it. Right. Yeah. Even though when they ask this question, why am I getting nuts? We didn't have an answer. By seeing this change, it'll prod them to question a love about that, about the nuts. It'll prompt them and open their curiosity to ask questions about other things. Why are we eating matzah? Why are we eating think? This is why we eat matzah, eat marar and lean. And that way we can answer them. We were slaves in Egypt, etc. This is a beautiful an incredible lesson in education. What's the, the most important thing or the beginning of education is not giving your kids information, actually. It's getting them curious, engaging them in conversation. Good answer, better answer. They'll get older, they'll get answers. In fact, as Alta was pointing out here, we don't even have answers to all our questions. Right? We ask four questions at the Manashtana. Right? Which which three did he say giving an answer to? Right? The matzah, yeah. marar, and reclining. But there's a fourth question we ask, which is why do we dip twice? Uh-huh. What answer do we have for him? None. So why do we do that? Uh-huh. Just to make him ask. But he doesn't have an answer. Why are we making ask questions if no answers to? Wow. That's the point. Wow. We're teaching the child that your curiosity is more important than whether you get a solution to the problem. Mm-hmm. Be engaged. It's much more important. So you don't have an answer to your question? Good. But at least you're, ask, you're asking. Right. You're engaged. You're involved. And the same thing here with the giving of the nuts. Right? The nuts and the, and the dipping is a similar thing. Just keep, keep them engaged. And getting them engaged means you got to give them sweets and make them ask questions. So you don't have an answer for them. So what? Give them. Make them ask questions. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Yeah. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why the wicked son is right after the smart, the, the wise one. So one, one of the answers is because the wise one is supposed to have a good influence on the wicked one. But another answer is because he's actually more engaged than the guys who follow. You have the wise, he's engaged, he's asking questions. You have the wicked, and after the wicked, you have the simple and the one who does not ask. The latter two are really interested. Right. The wicked one is number two because he's interested. Right. And that's, in a way, more valuable than the kid who's like not even asking any questions. Right. You know, sitting at a table bored, can't right. wait to leave. Yeah. Right. So better the wicked kid, so to speak, 
who's asking questions, who wants to know who's involved, right. then the kid is completely just oblivious to what's happening. Right? Yeah. And if the kid is in that state where he's oblivious, then give him nuts, give him candy, get something to ask him a question. Don't hound him with information. You don't go to the simple kid that's not asking. Right. right? What, what's the what's the how got the solution for the one who does not ask? What does I got to say? At psachla, you open him up. Right. It doesn't say at emerloi, go tell him the answers. No, first psachloi, open him up. And once he's open, asking questions, now you give him the answer. That's the most important part of the, the whole educational process. It's not to give your kids information, but to keep your kids engaged, keep them curious. <laughs> questions are so much more important than answers. Much, much, much more important than answers. Answers kills the subject. It's over. You answer. Yeah. <laughs> questions open up the subject. Now it's alive. Right. So ask. It's uh, one of the reasons that uh, traditionally the first Gemara kids learn is the beginning of Elam Metzius. Chapter 2 of Bab Metziah. The chapter is called Elam Metzius. Now, it discusses the laws of lost objects. In the first couple of pages of the whole chapter, the Gemara asks a bunch of questions and gives no answers. It says, Teku. Right, Teku, which means we have no answer. When Mashiach comes to get the answer. So what is this? The first time you're teaching a kid to give him a bunch of questions and no answers? <laughs> This is first engagement in Gemara? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the whole point. Teach the kid, you ask questions, you don't have an answer. Okay, so you don't have an answer. You have to know everything. You have to have an answer. You have to make sure the world fits into your little square box where you can explain everything. Right. That's not so important. What's much more important is that you're asking questions, you're engaged. You're part of the conversation. Not that you figured it all out and you know it all. Not important, no. You don't need that. You need to engage kids who can ask questions. And even if you as a parent don't know the answer, good, so you don't know the answer. By the same time, we make the kids ask questions that we also have no answers for. <laughs> and it's fine. And the whole point is get them engaged, get them to ask questions. Very powerful lessons in, uh, in education. Okay. Tomorrow we go back to the Gemara. And the Gemara will give us another actually beautiful set of halachas. The halachas of engaging your whole family in the enjoyment of Yom Tif. And how how one's supposed to do that, engaging one's wife, one's children, that's coming, God willing, in the next section of the Gemara, and then we'll go to the Shulchan Rock, which discusses that as well. Mm -hmm. A wonderful day. I already see you making a very catchy headline for this one. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah.